So let's move on to the data augmentation pipeline in detail. So what we do in augmentations is like you first take an image, that's the image of a cat, and then you have three more steps. So the first step is just a random crop to three size. Uh, this is a pretty standard augmentation. You use this in, in the, the standard image training. And then you, after you do a random crop to three size, you do a left right flip with a 0.5 probability. So after you have this like first step uh, in the set of augmentations, you apply a color jitter with a probability of 0.8 where you vary a few different parameters like brightness, hue, contrast, and a few other things. And we'll go uh, into this again in more detail in the code that we have following this presentation. So yeah, after color jitter, we have a grayscale filter, which is applied with a probability of 0.2. So if the grayscale filter is applied, this whole uh, color thing is like, yeah, the color simply vanishes and you have a grayscale image. And the final uh, augmentation we have is we do a Gaussian blur with a 0.5 probability. And here's the thing. So the original paper does a Gaussian blur on the ImageNet data set, but uh, does not use the Gaussian blur on CPAR 10. I think they do get the best results without using a Gaussian blur on CPAR 10. Yeah, no, I think it's good to highlight again that the, it, you know, choosing these particular transforms, what you're trying to say is the rotation or the size of the object that I care about shouldn't matter for the first one. And then for the second one, it's the color and the scale, right? So how much color is in there also shouldn't matter. Um, so that you're actually learning the actual representations of the object as opposed to like the pixel level information. So the noise, the colors, the distribution of colors and so on. Yeah. And what would seem is that you have a very specific set of transformations following one after the other. And this is not like coincidence. So this has been like experimented with and they have tried a bunch of different sequences and this is the best one they found out for their framework. Yeah, and I will say that in this, in this particular line of work in contrastive learning, mm -hmm. this particular sequence of how you do the transformations and how exactly you extract the, you know, I call them anchor and positive pairs, I guess, is, yeah. is going to really affect your results, right? I think that's been, at least in the results that I've gotten in my own research, um, and that we've even seen published as well is, is that is that if you if you modify this pipeline in a very specific way or if you just change it, it your results might drop significantly. Um, and I think SimClear suffers from that as well. Yeah, and there are other papers who which have followed this and have like better augmentation pipeline. And I, I think we could discuss that in the following talks after this. So yeah. Uh, so yeah, we like continue into the data augmentation pipeline. And one thing uh, is interesting at what the SimClear uh, paper has pointed out that they do a random crop and a resize. So there may be a case where they just have cropped out a part of an image and then the second crop is like a subset of that crop itself. So I think, Will, you would be able to explain this in more detail, how this translates to what DIM is doing in their paper. Yeah, there's a previous paper called AM DIM, which came out, I think, about a year before Sinclair. And this on, that's on the right side. So what you see on the right is their approach, right? So at a high level, AM DIM has the same idea. When you take a single image, and then you extract two versions of that image. Um, and then you run each version through a neural network, right? So a, a CNN most likely, and then they take the output feature maps from each spatial layer. So the first, like call it ResNet block one, ResNet block two, three, and so on. And then they compare across, right? So they'll take the first image and then they'll take the last RNN, uh, sorry, the last um, feature map block, and yeah. then they'll compare it to the first one of the second image, right? So this, they call it like cross um, spatial, um, Sorry, what do they call it? Yeah, they call it um, like spatial comparison, I think. Yeah, um, I remember the exact term. But yeah, for them, that's their positive pair, right? Right. And so you can look, you can look at simply the transforms that it's doing. So you see A and B are achieving the same effect in essence, right? So it's taking a small version of the image, like a, like a kind of subset, and then like a bigger version of that image. So I wouldn't say it's exactly the same, but it's trying to get at the same type of approach where it's saying, I'm going to look at a small part of it. Um, so like maybe just the face of something, 
and then I'll look at the whole object, so the whole body, including the background. Um, and so that, that idea is basically this particular transform is trying to overcome the inefficient sampling that AMDIM had, which is that you needed to do this across multiple feature maps as well. Yeah, and in a, in a similar sense that if the random crop gives you like two completely different subsets of a single image, uh, the Sinclair paper says that that's, it's like pretty similar to CPPV2. And uh, again, I would uh, give this to Will to explain in more detail because he has worked much more on CPC uh, than I have, so yeah. Yeah, so C CPC V2 is a contemporary paper to AMD and they were coming out around the same time, so within a few months of each other. Yeah. And they both were trying to do the same thing. And CPC, instead of taking a simple, a single image and applying two sets of transforms to get two versions of that image, what CPC did is that they took a single image and then they calculated these overlapping patches, right? So here, what you can see, it's like six by eight or uh, what is this? Eight by eight overlapping patches. Yeah. So you can think about it as like 64 samples of that image, right? Where each one captures a different part of it. And then they do this prediction task where they take the top patch, for example, and then they try to predict the patch below it somewhere using a CNN. So how we have this, um, this layer at the end of Simclear that projects H into Z, they had the same thing with these red networks, right? It's the same thing, um, but instead they were using this context prediction task. So kind of like at a high level, trying to do the same mapping between a, something before um, uh, an MLP and then something after. Um, they did the same thing with the CNN as well. Yeah. So Simclear, Simclear says, okay, well, we can basically do the same thing as well with this uh, random crop uh, transformation, right? So that's, I mean, it's not every single time. Obviously, they're going to get two patches that are not the same, but yeah. you will get enough patches that are not the same to be able to kind of replicate the CPC transform. So it's pretty clever. Like the random crop basically takes AMDIM and then CPC transforms, removes the sampling inefficiencies, and yeah. then like approximates them using this particular, um, uh, yeah, this particular transformation. Yeah, and what's interesting is like having just like a random chance that these two uh, exact situations would occur gives you better performance than actually having say, like a sequential prediction task. So like you have a pixel CNN over the CPC V2, right? So you literally predict like, the next patch using a sequence of previous patches. So yeah, having a randomized version of this is is more efficient and gives you better performance here. Yeah, I mean, for sure. Like even just looking at the number of comparisons, because in CPC you have to take every single patch at the top and compare it to every single patch at the bottom as well, right? So you're taking the top, comparing it times seven, and then the second times six, and third times five, and so it gets very, very inefficient very quickly. 